So good morning, everyone. Ed has finally decided to join us to do all his startup tips because it's his specialist subject today, not mine. Oh, well, you say that, though. You've started a business. You know other people that you've worked with. You've I started do, and that's why I kind of figure you're the expert in the field, but I can chip in with my two pennies worth. Um, because, like you said, I have started a business. I have been through a startup process actually twice. So I know what it's about. I know what I'm doing. I have a bit of knowledge in this area, but this one's for you. Well, so there's so many places to start from, but of course, no two businesses are the same. Now, again, I'm going to apologize for the echo that I have in this room. It's just, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's just the nature of the, the only room that I have available in this place. Um, so there, are, there isn't a one size fits all approach. So there are loads of different places where I thought, well, where do you start from? So I'm going to start with the rancher that I, I guess preach is going to be the word more than anything else. Um, I know a number of business owners who decide that they're going to business for whatever reason or don't go into business because they're scared. That's fine. Mm. There are three things that you always have to remember is that you know what you know. You have your skill set. Sam, there's little, if anything, that Sam doesn't know about social media and how to use social media to help spread your own personal and, and professional brand. So if you have any questions, then that's the person you want to speak to. Um, but that's you know, but that's fine. But Sam may not be, and I'm not saying that Sam isn't, but may not be an expertise in in terms of um, uh, finance. In, Actually, uh, or, I am a qualified. No, you might be because you're an ex-accountant. I know, I know, I know. That's why I said this. Like, no. She's an ex-accountant. But my point being is that we all know what we know, right? We all have our skills. We all know what we don't know because. Um, we're all fearful of it. We think I'm not going into business or doing this, but I don't know about this particular area. But we also don't know what we don't know because it's not a situation that's happened until we eventually trip up over it. So my first start is this. And my question to everyone is, how have you dealt with the challenge of working for yourself, but not by yourself? Because the most important thing for anyone starting a business is getting that business off the ground. But how do you deal with all the other challenges? How do you build your network? How do you get solutions to problems that you don't know the answers to? What has been the best way for anyone that is in this room right now, the best experience you've got of being able to work for yourself, but not by yourself? Part of the reason why I opened, you know, opened the co-working space. It's starting out with tricky questions. It's only 20 past 10 in the bleeding morning. And I'm not having coffee or much sleep. But that aside, you know. Um, you know what I found? Um, because you said about like building a network and, and all the rest of it. I went about it the opposite way. I got clients and then built my network. And the reason I did that was because I almost felt like a fraud stepping into the social media industry and working in the social media industry without actually having clients and without actually doing the work, which I know is the opposite to what a lot of other people do. Um, so I actually got the clients, got the experience, got my own knowledge, and then built my network. Brilliant. Can I recommend that everyone else does the opposite of that? <laughs> what I mean is the best time to network for a business is the moment you have the idea because that network can help influence your greatest and smoothest path of success. I'm not saying that you did anything wrong with that, Sam. It sounds, it's clearly worked for you and you're building a, a, an incredibly successful business, which is great to, to see and to, to be part of your journey. But um, the biggest challenge for everyone is, is getting out there and building that network. And, uh, and I would say the best time to do it. I started networking six months before I opened up doors to this place and it was the best thing that I could have done because it meant that the day we opened, I had customers. I had a buzz about this place. We had over 50 people, I think it was, to our launch event. It was a great, great night. Um, so it's, uh, I would say, a highly recommendable thing to network now. No matter what you're doing, yeah. I don't maybe wait until the end of this plan, by the way, but we'll network now. Um, today, tomorrow, but, but very, very soon. And start. And also, and networking is a challenge on itself because networking is works in different ways with different people. I mean, I do think one of the things I do, like I said, like I got my clients first for this business, but. Um, I did already have, I knew, geez, locally I know everybody. Um, on a local business scale, I, I know everybody. Um, and a lot of that comes from 
previous things I'd done, previous places I'd worked, and also when I had my market store, when I couldn't decide what I was going to be when I was a grown-up. Um, so local business-wise, I did know everybody on an online platform. Have you grown up? No. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. Still waiting for that to happen. Um, but, yeah, so, like, luckily in that respect, yes, I didn't network until I had clients because that made me feel more confident going into that business space but I think locally I did know a lot of people so I kind of wasn't that scared of putting myself out there because I knew at least on Twitter all the local business owners would follow me. <laughs> no and that's fair enough that's fair enough and, and, and I guess the um, the people buy from people are part of the thing that so many social media marketers tend to forget uh, is that ultimately it's still human interaction, whether it's because you've written a few words or whether you're in this environment or whether you're physically face-to-face -face with someone in a room. Um, ultimately, it's people buy from people. Organisations don't buy from organisations. That's not how it works. Um, so networking is a great way of doing that. Also, the, whatever business we do, it represents a part of who we are. There's so much more to us, so many more layers and colours um and the part of the reason well the reason why i like working with you for example sam is not because of necessarily what you do but because of the personality and everything else around you people unless they get to see that will not necessarily have the opportunity to buy from you i remember going to a networking event it was a bni event in my life do i dislike bni events um Purely, my, i understand they work for a number of businesses my dislike for them is because they're in the middle of the night usually and there, you have this your thing where you have to refer people in the room. Mm. It's like, well, what if I don't like the people in the room? I'd prefer to recommend someone else who I think has greater integrity rather than referring someone because I'm paying for the privilege to do that. But I went to a BNI, the first three people, first three people all said the very same words to me, which are, what do you do? They didn't say, how's the journey getting here or is it still raining outside or anything else other than that it was what do you do i didn't say hi how are you just oh, what do you do yeah. um it didn't matter what i did because even if i provided the very service they needed at that time the very thing that they were desperately short, short of they were no more likely to buy from me because they had no idea who i was with no trust or relationship foundation put there so when i got to the third person i said what what, why is that the first question you ask? And they said, um, oh, because it's, um, uh, you know, I just want to find out a bit more about you. Oh, well, I've got two children, I hate spiders, and I like my food. Anything else you'd like to know? Which might seem a little flippant, but it adds more information to who I am, which means more people are likely to, um, to buy from you. So that's I think, like, as well, yeah. that whole the process of people getting to actually know you as well. Like, I mean, me and Ed have had conversations about, like so many frauds that actually you know we started to... can we just do a blab about that yeah, oh that's great. what that one like oh that's still going this morning is that one <laughs> um but because of the interaction that i've had that other people have had that we've actually questioned going do you know what i don't think this person's all that and then all of a sudden you start seeing the warning signs and the red flags are coming up now, if we'd have taken them at the first meeting or that first point of contact of them saying, I'm the expert in this field, and we go, okay, yeah, that's fine, we believe you. Like, we'd have been totally sucked into that rabbit hole and believing their crap. The fact that we've gone, hang on a minute, let's just get to know this person a little bit better and then go, whoa, total fraud. We now know they ain't people we want to be associated with and do business with, which brings mm -hmm. it back to get to know the people first then decide if you want to do business. Simon Sinek does a great uh, TED talk around um, your, and, and a great book as well about understanding and knowing your why. So when you're starting a business, um, knowing how you do something and what you do, they're the easy bits. But the very first layer has to be why you're doing something. Because that, when you understand that, when you can articulate that, and when you go to a networking event and then they understand your why that lays a foundation stone for much greater professional relationship opportunity mm -hmm. so understanding why you're doing something is so much more powerful than what or how you do because there are so many more 
yeah, there are, people get hung up on competitors or out there. There are many people who do what you do. So oh, I know. Your USB is, is of course, you. Um, my blonde hair. And, and why you do it. My blonde And you, Rapunzel like yes. hair. I got new hair. Did I tell you I got new hair last week? Look, it's <laughs> you did. I think, I think it was about 453 hashtags on Instagram that highlighted that. <laughs> my new hair. It's important. Thanks, Leanne, for your attention. My business. <laughs> it's uh, yes. I uh, I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not uh, going to go into um, don't, don't go down new hair day, uh, Damien. Um, that's um, that's that's not a, if any day needs to be celebrated. It's Back to the Future Day, not new hair day. Oh, is that but so understanding. <laughs> go on. No, go on, go on. I just remembered. Oh yeah, Back to the Future Day. Yeah. Great. Um, I understand that many people see it as clickbait in terms of uh, social media, oh, it but it's equally the greatest film ever made, which is why I, I don't care. You know what? I had a conversation with someone last night, and while I was on the phone to them, and something popped up on my screen, I was like, "Oh my god!" Another Back to the Future thing just popped up on my screen, and, and the guy was like, "I've never seen the films." I was like, "What?" And I was like, "How can you have never seen the films?" He was like, "Well, in fairness, like I'm a lot younger than you." And I'm like, Fine, back off. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I can't believe you swore at them. I don't. I don't mind. I mean, it's like, okay, I really feel. I feel really old now that I have to watch, I've been to see all of the films at the actual cinema. Morning, Damien. Good morning, everyone. You okay? It's like the dream team back again. It is, isn't it? It's like powerhouse. Yeah. Um. So can I? So so my first tip to go back to your original point, Sam. I feel, I feel like I've got still making up to do from being late into this. But my first tip is to um, understand your why you do what you do and then get out there and network. No matter whether you've started trading or not, get out there and, uh, and build your, your networking. Is that something you've done, David? Yep, I can res resonate with that, uh, Ed, because um, recently um, I actually host my own event each month. So every oh, time, every time I do that once a month... Um, I'm not out there to physically sell my services, but I do it through, I don't know if you've heard of Link for Growth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I'm actually a district leader for them within Bradford. So basically I, I'm concentrating on that per month. But the, the idea is I put that message across what Link for Growth are about uh, rather than just, you know, selling what I do basically. But then people ask me what I do, then that's like the secondary thing. And then obviously I get things from that. I mean, it's just how it works really. For me but I, I mean the thing is there are so many different types of networking events the link for growth um concept is one that allows you to meet the other person to actually get to know the people that are there a much more of an informal process rather than this structured pitching and um and this is what i do and buy from me and recommend me because you have to mm -hmm. uh, which i think is much better because as i say people buy from people buy from People. Yeah, it's people to people, and that's it. You know, that's the uh, relationship that that we need these days. You know, in the nineties, you know, late nineties, you have companies just uh, that well, they still do it today. That they kind of hide hide behind their company name and they just like ignore emails and just never get back to people. Where now you need to be on it now, not tomorrow. Otherwise, you're just going to lose people. So, and, and I, th I think as well, the more people you get out there and meet that are from different places, different backgrounds, different industries, mm -hmm. just, and you know what? You never know when that contact might be used. Like the other day and I was like, oh, I need someone to do something. And I was like racking my brains. I was like, oh, I know we'll be able to help me with this. Yeah. And straight away, you know, and it's like, but, it's not. But equally, it's not, it, it, it's, it's even deeper than that because, so we all know uh, uh, the average number of, strong connections that a human has throughout their life is about 150 people okay 150 friends um, uh, um, now if you think that of course each of that 150 people has or we all know at any given time sorry 150 people and all of them know 150 people as well that means that we're technically two handshakes away from over 20,000 people so even though the person that you meet at a networking event may be not likely to buy from you um, you never know who they know. Yeah, oh, exactly. Strike a call for them. You build a relationship with them. You never know 
um, who uh, uh, they might have connections with. I remember one of my clients saying, I'd really like to get to a networking event. I, I sell software to accountants. I want to go to a networking event that's full of accountants, which I thought, I know, it'd be one of the dullest networking events I've ever been to, no offense, Sam. Uh, but I also thought <laughs> that, again, it's a very short-sighted way of going to a networking event because when you're speaking to someone, that person may have experience that can help you grow a business, help you grow your business, and they may know connections that can help you in your customer or your supply chain. It's such a bigger tool than the obvious thing of, I want to go there and meet a client, which is far from the right way of going to a networking event. But you know what? Accountants are great people to network with because they have clients. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All different industries. Yeah. Um, the, um, and that's one of the things about BNI, um, which I know Damien, you said in the comments that you've been investigating. I think BNI works if you've got a potentially huge referral pool. If you're an accountant, a painter, a decorator, a car mechanic, you know that someone in that room is going to need you at some point. Yeah. But the minute you then start to size that down and reduce that potential referral pool, such as social media marketing, WordPress development, whatever that may be, then suddenly it's going to be harder to get your the value back from the clients that you may or may not have mm. been referred to you during the BNI. So that's my always kind of caution. I would always say go to a BNI as a guest, you can experience it and help widen the network. But Oh yeah, yeah. I, th I think you've got to. Uh, I with what I'm researching at the minute with BNI, I think you've got to uh, have more of a varied um, service, if you like, to get in there um, rather than just saying I do one aspect. It, I guess it depends which area um, that you're going into at the BNI. Um, but I just recently um, got a new customer locally where. They are, they are in the BNI and is a photographer. Um, and so uh, he said, um, just be a bit cautious when if you are looking at going into it because they do ask for, you know, they ask for £700 pound up front, I think, if that's yeah. what I'm right in saying. Yeah. And um, so they asked for that up front, but then he didn't get any work or anything until three, four months into it. So it's kind of... Oh, you know, yeah. I guess you've got to work it, I guess. I don't know. I'm not too I sure. I think a lot of those as well, like our eyes and some, you know, and if you're paying a hefty fee, there's got to be, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business expense and there's got to be a return on that. You know, you can't just yeah. go writing it off, can you? Um, so you've either got to be giving you a lot of value. Um, and I, I was reading one the other day and it was like, oh, and if you pay more, you can speak at our events. I was like... Yeah, I, well, because I can't speak while I'm there. <laughs> I don't even know. Someone somebody, tried to shut you up. Somebody tried to shut me up. They didn't get very far. Um, but yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, and it was kind of like, well, hang on a minute. If you want me to pay a registration fee and come to your events in the first place, then I'm going to bleeding well speak. And, and I actually went to a taster event for one, but I don't think the woman liked it because, like, me walking into a room full of people, like, oh, hi, I'm here. Um, um, I totally stole the thunder a little bit, really. She actually tried to out – I was in a conversation with somebody else, and she was obviously not liking the direction of the conversation. And um, so she tried to like chip in and she was like, oh yeah. And she, oh, she was on, I was showing them Periscope on my phone. So like quite a few people crowded around to have a look at it. And I was just like showing them, oh yeah, he's live at the moment. And somebody was like, I knew, so I commented and I was like, hi, I'm you. And so they spoke back to me in their broadcast. And the one was like, oh, well, um, somebody I knew used to go pro. And I was, I was like, you can't use a GoPro on Periscope. And she was like, oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. But it was like so obvious she was trying to upstage me and be like, I don't want to you. <laughs> I use GoPro. I was like, can't use a GoPro. <laughs> I, um, I, yeah, I think networking has its, um, has its absolute place and is vitally important. But ultimately, um, you have to approach it in the right way. And I think a networking event should be approached by going to a networking event and A, don't take any business cards with you. Um, B, go with the sole intention of helping someone else at that networking event. By referring an article you've read or an individual that you've met that you know is going to help that business grow law of reciprocity what means it will come back and support you but it also and i love this idea go to a networking event and don't take a business card 
And I know that those people get hung up on the business card thing, but it's too in. The business card should only contain contact information. It shouldn't be the thing that differentiates you from other people. But second to that, if you take a business card of someone else, you're in control of when you get in touch with them again. So for that reason, don't take any business cards to a networking event and just see how it changes your mindset and your whole approach to it, rather than just wandering around with cards going, who do I give this to next? Um, most of it's a waste of money. Yeah, so there is a question there. Do you want, <laughs> do you want to go for that one first? Well, we'll do this one first. Any tips for a foreign firm that would want to set up a subsidiary startup office in London? Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your business, actually? Let's have a look. Come oh, on, lifestyle. Oh, oh, I'll let you in. Italians. Ooh. We've not had one of them on before. <laughs> Good morning. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. No, it's not. It's not really related to my wife's Italian lifestyle blog. It's um, we're setting up a company here that's uh, dealing with beacon technology, mm. you know, and apps and stuff like that. And we have some contacts in London that are basically telling us, you know, you have to be in the center of. of you have to be in London to really get involved in, in the sort of. Uh, but we also. Or just it's a new business that we're extending here in Italy first in Milan once we have a good client base. But my approach was, and I know that I think I've seen Ed before in regards to that we have spoken about uh, co co office solutions, co you know that sort Probably of solutions. For that. <laughs> okay, so the the point is that we were thinking of probably next year opening something up in in London on a on on a basic small space co office solution to start networking and start doing something of that nature but i know that there's a whole series of i'm not even going to talk about the whole aspects of setting up a company in england and all that which is a sub the second route that we would have to look at but we were quite interested because in, i know that right now in london there's a lot of movement around this sort of you know app building technology with beacons and stuff like that so that's why i was curious Tips, yeah. Tips would be, I mean, so tips would be what, what, what areas of London? I know the short ditch. I think sh short ditch is becoming quite important in that aspect, and and, and a lot of you know. So that's what I was. Curious about. I, I like what I like is um, if you're looking for an advocacy of London, you've chosen two more <laughs> to chat with about this, which are uh, <laughs> which, which are going to limit the response that you're possibly okay. hoping for on this. One. No, but like, so, um, so the subject. But, but then actually, that, I guess that my, well, my point being is actually that um, sure, um, Shoreditch is um, is has been called, has been nicknamed rather uh, lamefully, I would say, the the Silicon Valley exactly. because it's the the Silicon Valleys of the southeast right. of England. Um, there is a lot of ag businesses that have started up in in Shoreditch because everyone feels that that's the place to be, and it's quality over quantity for some of those. And a lot of those don't necessarily succeed. Shoreditch is a great place to meet new people, but it depends why exactly. you go there. Good point. And I would say, it, it, you know, if you if you don't know the answer to that one, then maybe Shoreditch. And I don't say that Shoreditch may not be the place because there are plenty of places throughout the rest of the UK. Manchester is a hub of, of startup you know, activity. I know, I know, uh, I know also Cambridge. Brighton. So, so Brighton, other, Brighton is quite good. Uh, technological. Yeah, well. I've um, I posted a link. Um, just now on the comments section to at work hubs, which is an example of a co-working space in, uh, which is in Houston, in a uh, 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 station in kind of north central London, uh, not far from Shoreditch and any of those areas. But um, what is great about the place is it epitomizes what the benefit of the co-working concept is. Right. So you go there to focus solely on getting your business off the ground, but in that room, in a very informal way, in a very cost-effective way, because I'm a big fan of bootstrapping when you're starting a new business, is you've got other people who have walked in your shoes. That's the main thing. That's um, the main thing. So that's the main thing. they will be able to do And it doesn't matter what industry they're in, they walked in your shoes and getting the business off the ground and finding a new networking base in that location. So even, um, even, go and chat to them. Even um, if I'm a yank. <laughs> But even if you're, but you're not, you're in town, aren't you? Of course. <laughs> like, like me. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah. In fact, London is London is one of those. Uh, one of the I used to live. Uh, I grew up in London, and the thing that I love about London more than anything is its multiculturalism. Yeah. So, uh, so there is also it. like Ed said, um, about Manchester. 
Um, and if you look at places around Media City in Manchester, there are some amazing mm -hmm. like technology hub workspaces there um, that you know you can literally rock up, rent a hot seat, um, and they have right. some fantastic facilities there. You know, it's everything is within the actual building for you to use. Um, they even have like testing labs. You know, and there's people that work there yes. that go and test your apps and all all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And obviously, because it's north, it's a lot cheaper than London as well. You know, it's not as expensive, exactly. um, exactly. but amazing yeah. facilities. We're, we're still we're still at an early stage of studying this, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the business plan. It's indicated that for 2016, we would like to do some sort of a move in that in that direction. Mm. And uh, there's a couple of Italian companies, clients of ours, that are already doing something quite similar, and they're not even in the tech field. They're in fashion and other. They're starting yeah. to go into co-working co spaces in London just to get the buzz of the networking and, and, and the who, who knows who and this and that and the connections. So that's quite interesting. That's it. That was my question. Thanks for letting me in. No worries. But do let us know. I mean, we'll stay connected through um, through Blab and Twitter Excellent. as well. But let us know how you get on. And um, if you go to if you go to the Twitter account at Work Hubs, you'll be the chap who runs it called Phil. Um, he's a he's a, a very generous very guy in terms of we'll helping out that. with his knowledge and experience. So, Thank you. No worries. Good luck, mate. See ya. They were going multicultural um, today, aren't we? Yes, for the UK and Irish business buzz, it's good. It, it's a uh, it's, it's great. There's another question about has anyone worked with um, LEPs, which are local enterprise partnerships? And I did Steve Vietti, which um, is my favorite um, uh, account name of the day. Uh, the hasn't, um, he says, uh, lurking today, I'm an employee, not self employed, but work with a lot of small businesses. Uh, okay. But jump in if you want to. Um, if, you, if you there's an open seat, Steve, so jump in and give us more information about what you want from that one. I know you're talking about growth accelerator, growth hubs, but it depends ultimately what you want from your LEP. If you're looking at it as an incubation hub, then there are some fantastic. Uh, yeah, the growth accelerator is a great tool for that one, uh, and much underused, I would say. Um, and there are some fantastic accelerators that are um, uh, often publicly funded, usually by LEPs uh, yeah. across the country. Uh, so come in, Steve, region, can't you as question. well? Because I know some of the ones where I live, I'm sort of like in between three regions almost, and like one is almost non-existent. Another one I won't touch with a barge pole, but then another one's actually all right. Um, so yeah, sometimes you are quite dependent on your region as to how good your local hubs are. Absolutely, and it's often down to um, uh, uh, down to the individuals themselves. Um, but there are there are so many good incubators and accelerators. There's a massive program here in, in Cambridge, uh, the Entrepreneurial Spark, as I mentioned. There is another one I know of it. I haven't had experience working with it, um, but there's a there's a great amount of uh, of support out there as well. But it's just again about knowing why and what it is you're looking to get from them because there are startups for many different reasons. And, and one of the things that's um, uh, uh, one of my favourite books, and I should uh, probably go and get this. Uh, one of my favourite books I've ever read when it comes to business is um, Stephen Covey's um, "The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People," which he never originally wrote as a business book. He wrote it with his morbid beliefs in a way of being a better human being. But actually, many businesses are taking it as to being one of the most impactful aspects of running a business. Um, and he, one of his tips, I think, the second. Um, habit in there we're starting with the end in mind so what is it that you specifically want to get to are you looking to grow a business to a particular point that you can then employ people are you looking to grow are you looking to build an app that you can eventually sell on what's the re what's the reason for doing what you're doing what's your end goal so that at least you know you're on track for that and then when you know that then a load of so many of the incubation hubs and accelerators are out there will be much greater clarity in getting the valuable services from them if you know what you need because that's the destination that you're aiming for so much like we would say at the point you raised in the book, um, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? A question that I know Sam is still deliberating over, but the um, but it's the same it's the same factor. If you you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's a question for everyone. How close are you near to to, 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 to what your thought was then? Same, what's the book title? Well. 
It's the seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey. It is my favorite. I've written, or oh, blimey, um, around, must be about 40 years ago now, 30, 40 years ago. Maybe it wasn't that long. Um, I'm just going to get the um, uh, Amazon link up and, and post it. But it is a brilliant, brilliant, very enjoyable read and my favorite, most inspirational book uh, as well. So start with your end in mind is the, ha the second habit from that. But there are loads of other habits as well. Um, that, that will help for sure. So I would definitely go out and buy that book. I'm allowed yeah. to promote other oh, people's Steve, stuff. Oh, Steve, yes, he's coming in. We'll let him. Just because he's got a cool username. Hi there. You're not a Yeti! Uh, not quite, not quite. In fact, you've barely got any hair at all. Yeah. Things. It's, um, yeah. <clears throat> what, what I just wanted to pop in to say quickly um, was when you were talking about people having to know what they need from their uh, LEDs. Sorry, can you hear me okay on this? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. One of the best services I've found our local growth hub provides to a lot of the small businesses we don't necessarily work with but are in contact with through our networking is really helping them clarify their business goals. Because we get so many people come to us and say, oh, we, we think we need help with our marketing. And to be honest, they need help with every aspect of their business because they've, um, like, um, for instance, there's this one guy who's an engineer, 30 years in engineering, brilliant engineer, but his business plan, it's, it's just not there. And I think that's probably one of the most valuable services the very cover around by us provide. It's just a little bit of coaching, clarity on business propositions. Absolutely. This goes back to, I think, one of the first things that I said on this black, which is don't work for yourself. <laughs> Sorry, work for yourself. Have your own business. Mm -hmm. Don't work by yourself. And through accelerator hubs, through networking, through co-working, there is a, a, and you know, in the UK last year alone, there were over 500,000 businesses that were started up. And the best support for all those 500,000 businesses, I think, for me, are all the other 500,000 businesses that have started up uh, last year and also those that started up before that because they know the better doesn't matter what industry they're in they know what it's like to start a business they know the challenges you know if you if anyone here has, uh, has had a child and has joined an nct group they know that that nct group is more than just helping them through have that particular process of having a baby but all the other support that they have has around it as well it's effectively the same for a business too so um uh yeah accelerators are a brilliant place to get real true and trusted um, business support, Stephen. So uh, I appreciate you bringing that in. But the business plan is a really interesting debate because there are many people who don't believe in business plans. Many people who think the business plan should be this massively thick war and peace type document. But for me, I think there just needs to be some core aspects to a business plan. So I'm not a believer that you should have this huge document, but there are some certain aspects that I think are vital for any new business that starts up. Uh, I'm beginning to get anyone else's thoughts as to what they think that should be. For me, the first point, well, I guess it's a no ticker order, but the one thing that I'm going to focus on, because it's the thing that trips most businesses up, is cash flow forecasting. If you don't have any money, you don't have a business. And I'm not saying that everyone has to go out and borrow thousands of pounds, because that's not always the right solution either. But just making sure that you've got enough business, enough money to put food on the table, to pay your bills, to do all the things you need to do, as well as to start your business, is... I, I, you know, I can't highlight how much that is, is valuable. And I'm sure, Stephen, you would have seen Definitely. it in a lot of businesses um, you work with. I keep interrupting you a second, call? boys. Um, we've got a few people that keep trying to call in, and I'm not letting you in because there's nothing in your profile. So if you need to ask a question or you want to tell us about you, please put it in the comments because I'm not going to let you in until we know who you are. Anyway, carry on. If your name's not Dan, you're not coming in. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely echo the cash flow thing. And um, something I found uh, with a lot of the networking events I've been to around my local area, um, there are so many people there who come with with an idea, um, not even a fully formed business. You know, they've got their limited company, but they've got nothing else. And you've got a question why you're kind of putting the, the cup for the horse in that you're networking with businesses when there's really nothing to offer from either of you because you're not at that stage yet. So I, I agree with you in the sense that you don't have to have your, you know, your manual, your thick manual for a business plan, but you've certainly got to have some steps and goals to go through because starting a business is such a hectic time. If you don't have that kind of process-oriented mind, 
you try and do everything in one go, you end up working 100 hour weeks, and you burn out. And I think that's a big part of why we see so many business businesses by us fail in the first couple of years, because people don't quite understand the processes they need to go through, how to get funding, how to get investment, how to build their brand, all that sort of stuff. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, it, for me, a business has to be at the epicenter of a, a three-part Venn diagram, if you like. So first part is doing something that you love doing. If you don't enjoy it, then you're soon going to get bored of it. Doing something that you're good at, because what you enjoy may not necessarily be your primary skill, and doing something that makes you money, because without that, it's nothing more than a hobby. And I think two people get hung up on one of those particular areas. And I, the thing that really frustrates me uh, is people saying, oh, the thing you need for a business is passion. No, it's not. Because if you don't have a market that's going to buy that passion, you don't have a business. End of story. Um, I could be very passionate in buying hats for chairs. I don't know anyone that's going to necessarily buy them. That might be my passion, but it doesn't matter how much I try and preach it. If no one's going to buy it, it's a non-starter. But you do need passion. You need to love what it is you're doing. You need to be good at what you're doing. But, if it, it, but most important as well, you need to make money off it, except you're not going to make a profit in those very early months or possibly years, and therefore another key reason for the cash flow. But you do need to make money from it eventually, otherwise it's a non starter. Definitely. definitely. And um, I, I, again, I think we'll just keep agreeing with each other over and over here. But, um, <laughs> so, Stephen, if anyone wanted to, you work with a lot of small businesses yourself, you said. So if anyone wanted to get in touch with your uh, accelerator, um, how can they do um, Well, in Gloucestershire, uh, where we're based, we have the Gloucestershire Growth Hub, um, which is based out of the university. It's this absolutely fantastic building. I think it, I've only seen two or three growth hubs through the UK, but I'd have to say ours is the best. Absolutely. Um, they've got two or three conference cool. rooms. They've got five or six meeting rooms. You literally just walk in, walk up to the reception, have a little chat with the people there. They'll put you in touch with the staff at the Growth Hub, who in turn will you know, assess exactly what it is you need, what kind of help you need. And they can put you in touch with Growth Accelerator if that's where you need to go. If not, they'll put you in touch perhaps with other businesses like us who can say, okay, you need marketing. We are not affiliated with, but you know, these guys here do this very well. Perhaps you'd like to talk to them. Or you know, if you need a business coach, here's how you get in touch with Growth Accelerator. So it's a really easy process around where we are. I don't know if it's the same around where you guys are, or if it's a little more convoluted. Um, well, I'm up north. Cambridge, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Cambridge is a, is, is a wash. Primarily the university puts a lot of money into supporting startups, primarily scalable new businesses, tech-related ones, and, and, and as many investors do tend to invest in startup teams. Um, but equally as well, there's support here in Cambridge for many what I call lifestyle businesses, that people who are starting a business because it's something that they want to convert oh, 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 business or, or they start a business because they want to food on it. There's someone that they went, hello, can you hear me now? Hello? You right right now. Right. Oh, you went a bit crackly on me there. Okay. Uh, it's lack of coffee. Uh, the, um, so, there's, so the university invested in... in, in tech teams or scalable businesses um whereas there's also a lot of lifestyle business support so people who work because they want to just put food on the table they want to pay for a round the world trip or they're turning a hobby into a business so there's there's a lot of um, uh, 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 support here in cambridge but you know i think there is a lot of undis unknown support or undiscovered support both from the private and the public sector around the whole country um, and even if there isn't there are as Damien mentioned through his in Bradford, the link for growth. There's all, you know, there's um, and others as well. There's there's networking events, and that in itself can prove to be massively valuable support for everyone too. Definitely. Um, how does it work up north then, Sam? Oh, it's a free for all up okay, yeah. here. Um, <laughs> there, there's very much. Uh, I. Don't... <laughs> I was going to get all stereotypical. What they do is they meet at ferret clubs and they um, well, drink ale. Ferret, for breakfast. So we drink carp. They work 25 hours a day in a mill and, uh, sorry, um, I mean, we do have a lot of the same services. Um, some of them I have found are dominated by the same people. So I don't tend to get involved and they become a little bit clicky and one-upmanship. Um, so there's quite a 
few local services a little bit like that. There's some other very good services, um, some government funded ones, some local enterprise funded ones as well. Um, but yeah, I kind of think sometimes it, it's a little strange where I am because Preston in itself, um, it's a bit of a kick up the arse. Um, but we're on the cusp of Manchester. Manchester's doing great. Like, so the services there are fantastic. And then you're almost getting to the postcode lottery. So if you want to use the Manchester based services, you've got to make your postcode or be nice to someone. You know, if I wanted to use the services local to me, I probably wouldn't get much benefit from them. We have exactly the same problem by us. Um, the Gloucestershire Great Club is a brilliant team, and everyone loves it. And we have people from just across the river in Wales asking how they can access these services and this funding. And we have to tell them there's nothing we can do. You've got to go to the Welsh government and whatever their system is, which is yeah. 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 Well. And that's a shame that almost you can be in a, in a postcode lottery, you know, and sometimes it's like, well, it's not my fault that's my postcode, you know. And but that's the beauty of, that's the, you can argue that that's the beauty of things like Black yeah. as well, that you've got that opportunity I mean, to, uh, to tap into that support. Yeah. I mean, obviously, because I work in the online industry anyway, and um, so I'm always going to get more benefit from online worldwide anyway. Um, but when I take that world into my local network, it doesn't always sit very well. Um, so I kind of think perhaps I'm, just more niche that I can benefit more benefit more from what I can get online and what I can get locally. But you know, there's other businesses that probably do benefit greatly from the local services, but perhaps I just don't fit into their ideal business. So we've talked a lot about the um, the public money, the, the government money. How do you guys? How useful do you guys find if you do um, kind of start up new business networking? Uh, do you find those kind of links are useful? Because around by us, we I, I think I must get an email a day from a new networking group. And it all gets a little bit much around here. Um, and oftentimes, it's it's not that useful, I find. You've got 10, 10, 20, 30 startups in a room all telling each other what they do. And none of them really have any discernible skills to offer each other. Or, or with that sort of um, fresh-faced, eager, naive ability, um I, I remember once going to one and there was probably 20 people, maybe more, um, all, all startups, all sort of here I go. And, and it was actually, it was, um, it was actually funded by the local council and it was half a day and some of it was training, some of it was networking. And I remember sitting in this like classroom style room and the desk went like that all around and the guy giving the speech. And then suddenly I thought, I think I know more than the guy giving the speech here. And um, and then it went round the room, and I was like, probably out of twenty people there, there was two, probably including myself, that I was like, there's only two viable businesses in this room, like, and it was at that point I was like, how much benefit am I getting from going to startup events? And even though they were saying, oh well, to apply for this grant or to get this or to get this, you have to go on all these things. I'm like, really? Like, I'm getting no benefit from going to these things, so perhaps I'm not actually that bothered. Um, and I thought that was the thing. There seemed to be no almost qualifying factor of what made a startup. And um, they can call themselves a startup, really. And there were, yeah, and there are people there who were obviously only doing it to cheat the benefit system as well, because that's, yeah. that's a big thing, isn't it? You know, like, oh, I'm self-employed, so therefore I can get working tax credits. You know, and that that's a big issue I find. Um, there's a lot. Oh, our, our main speaker is buggered off. Um, <laughs> Just the two of us. That's it. Um, so yeah, I think there's almost that thing of like, if you're in a startup group, surely you have to almost be qualified as a startup, like uh, be a genuine startup rather than just going, yeah, I'm a startup. Like, <laughs> definitely. Uh, I think that, uh, as you said, sorry, sorry. Oh, you're all right. <laughs> Um, now he's coming back now. Uh, no, I think you're you're all right at my end. Who's echoing? Uh, you okay? It's probably yeah. blab. It's been doing it for a few days now. Yeah. Um. I was going to say my advice, and I, I have to preface this with, um, obviously, I'm 21. I, I work in an agency, so my my advice perhaps isn't as sage as everyone else's who's gone through this, but um. With the startups and things I work with, have worked with, mostly SMEs rather than startups, I tell them 
And those events are good once or twice, but they do become a waste of your time. And as a small business, time is one of the biggest, most valuable commodities. But, yeah, well, and actually, it's it's an expensive resource. People think that money is the only thing that you need to worry about when starting a business. But I would spend time equally as wisely as I do money. Um, but Lee has joined in. Good morning, Lee. Good morning, Lee. You've um, joined in because um, Lee made a point to say you have to weed out the chaff. Um, I nearly read that's chaff, but that's entirely different. So what? So what? Um, what do you mean, Lee? Okay, well, obviously, I do search engine optimization, um, and um, I've been to um, a lot of um, events, if you like, um, been invited by Barclays Bank to speak at new business uh, startups, conferences, if you like. So, you know, um, as Sam was saying, you know, there's some cases, you know, you see people just there just to cheat the doll or whatever the case might be. And, you know, I've been in these events and you can definitely see, you know, who's paying attention, who isn't paying attention when we talk about digital. Because a lot of these people, they kind of, don't matter what industry you're in, whether it's a traditional print um, to manufacturing, you know, digital plays a massive, massive part of, of business these days. You know, and I've been speaking about um, all realms of digital marketing, email marketing, social media, SEO, um, retargeting, etc. And you, you can just tell people that are, are just there for, uh, you know, a day out of the office, so to speak. And, um, you know, uh, people that are genuinely interested. And, um, and with the people that are interested, they will generally come up to you and start speaking to you a little bit more uh, depth after you've given your uh, little, you know, speech or whatever. And the other ones are just there for the hors d'oeuvres, you know, and, um, just for the free coffee. So, um, but that, that's just my point of view. I'm not saying everybody is, uh, is uh, you know, useless, but most people are. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I think um, start. It's, uh, so it's so true, though. Like I said, you know, the event I went to, there's 20 people in the room, and there was probably two viable businesses, and one of them was my own. Um, but it, it is just. But what's your definition of viable? Oh, I'm going to go into business. They have no clue, like literally no clue. Well, what's your definition of viable, sir? Well, for start, I mean, one of them was, I'll give you a few examples. One of them was he wanted to open um, like a cafe type thing, okay? But he only wanted to specialise in like fancy cooked meats and all this kind of stuff. And, and he had this great artisan idea. But then when the guy actually said to him, okay, so how are you going to produce like your meats? So are you going to buy them? Oh, no, no, I'm going to cook them. I'm going to do this, that and the other. And he was like, oh, so you have experience of doing this? No. All right, so you have this beautiful artisan idea about selling these beautiful cooked meats, but you've never actually cooked a meat in your life. Um, and then he didn't know what equipment was needed. He just had no clue at all as to the whole setup. And even somebody said to him about, oh, well, how would you stand there on like, you know, waste product and all this. And he was like, oh, well, it'll keep. I was like, no, it won't. <laughs> then, you can argue Simon Woodruff, who started Yo Sushi, had absolutely no experience in making sushi before he started the brand. Uh, you know, there are many who start off, I mean, admittedly, I'm pointing one out story out of thousands that have failed. Um, and, and there has been a top of that. But, you know, and I think that's, uh, maybe that's because I'm more optimistic in, it, uh, I'm not saying more optimistic than you, but more optimistic in, in the fact that there are many businesses who are often put off by either media or by their banks. Prime yeah. example, I know when I was starting this business that when I went to the different banks to seek funding, they didn't get the concept, so I was immediately dismissed from them by going, it's a rubbish idea. But they didn't get it, so who were they to say that it was a, a bad idea? Um, that, um, but admittedly, there are some basics that you need to know, but it sounds like the guy who you met has had didn't know what those basics were but that's uh... no he'd obviously just been in some and also i mean it was quite funny because like i mean the area he said he wanted to set this business up and i was like you don't have no football like oh but people will come to me it's like anyway anyway <laughs> like sorry anyway um so it's very much like yes we can all have little airy fairy ideas and a nice little business to set up but you have to know where it's going to make the money. Like I, I see so many, I get inquiries every single day 
from like app developers or businesses and, and straight, my first thing is well how are you going to make your money on that because i'm thinking well if you want me to do work for you you're gonna to have to pay me so i want to know how you're making your money um and they literally go oh that will come that and that's fine like if you think yeah that's fine you're setting up a business and it will come but where is the money going to come from? that goes back to my point earlier is you have to be at the sweet spot of um you know doing something that you love good at but it's also going to make you as money as well i was going to share a link but i appreciate that sam may kick me out if i share a link to my website that focuses on that particular bit so before i actually I'll hit enter sales pitch it so again i'll let you as long as you don't sales pitch it no no, no no it's purely just an information piece that says that this is the epicenter of anyone i totally agree it's not a sales pitch um, it'll be ironic being booted out of my own uh, blab but um uh, it it doesn't, wouldn't surprise me. Anyone who's met Sam will know it's every chance that can happen at some point. You know, but that, but that goes back to my point as well. That it has to be the epicenter of those three. Sorry, Lee. No, that's fine. Um, all dark like you just put in the um, messages. Um, I got people wanting websites for new business. Some of to pay me when they make a profit. Um, in the same goes for the SEO world. Uh, there's something called pay per performance. I've had a lot of these startup companies. Um, asked me to work on their SEA on, on the websites and, and and they'll pay me back when they get on the first page or, or oh, turn over the topic. Well yeah. well with all due respect, but I've got better things to do in my day, like watch Jeremy Kyle or work on your website, you know? So um that's I, I don't personally I, like I'd it. love you to actually set that line to someone. I'd Jeremy love to work on your website but I've got to uh, now you know, so um, no, but seriously, you know, it's just um, it it just doesn't work, you know, because I could essentially go out and spam the hell out of your website just to get you one page one to get five grand. It's not really worth it, you know, and that's not really good planning by the business owner. But you know what? I I almost I take it actually, isn't it? Because I get a lot of those inquiries as well. You know, the whole like when we make a million in our first twelve months, and we'll pay you so well for this. I'm like, you want to be in business in twelve months? Um, but I actually find it an insult, to be honest, that a person, another person, would approach me to do work, ask me to potentially do it for free, on the back of their success when. I'm the one in business making an income and they're the one that doesn't have a business yet. Like, I, I take that as an insult that they devalue me and my services so little. What I want to know is, do they pop into a Starbucks and say, I'd like a tall coffee, please, and if it keeps me awake for the rest of the day, I'll pay you for it. Exactly. Because it wouldn't, so why treat any other business the same way? Yeah. Bring it back to that point of, you, know, you have to ensure your cash flow from the very beginning. Um, I've always viewed it very much as a, a kind of business responsibility in the sense that we've had on more than one occasion invoices that don't get paid by people that misrepresent themselves almost you know they they say they have this cash flow i mean there's always an element of goodwill when you deal with an sme a basement bob a guy just getting started and um, i i just I guess moral isn't really a word you use in business too much, but it, it's completely irresponsible to take services and say you will pay for them if you're not sure you can pay for them. Everyone has bad months, cash flows and issues, these kind of things can be worked out. But I know we personally, we put them straight on the blacklist and we tell everyone we do business with. You know, these are people that won't pay invoices. They're three months in arrears, they make you chase them, and it's not a good way to do business. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, in terms of conditions, I think it's a whole new, uh, a whole new conversation in itself as well. Is that um, very often people are people are scared to ask for money when they're yeah. starting out business or when they're a young business because they kind of feel, well, if I push them, they're going to go and buy from somewhere else. Well, good. If they're going to go, for, if they're going to be a pain in the ass, let them go and buy from somewhere else. Bad clients don't change. And I know that you need to get paid for what you do, but if you have a bad client, it's a tip for anyone, if you have a bad client, suck them. Because they don't get any better, they will constantly be a ball ache. And go and use that extra space you have now to find someone who gets you, wants to work with you, and, as Stephen pointed out, will pay you. That's a big problem with SMEs we find as well. They don't know how to say no. Uh, they, they're so ready, they, they see a client, they want to take it, they want more and more and more business. And, you find them that they're in kind of one of a few situations 
where they've got a lot of clients that aren't paying or clients that don't fit their business model. They take on staff to service these clients that don't pay, that don't really fit their business model. They find these staff don't work and you're five years down the line and you look at them and you say, well, two years ago, you had a profitable business. What's gone wrong? And that's what it is. They, they just don't know how to say no because they think any business is good business. And that's yeah. a really hard lesson to learn. But that's not it. You can get stuck between the rock and the hard place there when you're a startup because you know we've all got bills to pay. We all need to keep the roof over our heads, and sometimes you'll take the bit. And I mean, I'm guilty of it. I've done it plenty of times. I've taken people where I'm even like you know typing the reply to the email, going, no, "I don't want to do business with you." You know, Christmas is coming. Want to take them off? No one's presents. And you know, come January, you're going to have to go, I don't want to know you, don't want to know you, go away. <laughs> but the thing is, though, surely, I mean, this is my business model, if you like, it's quality over quantity. I mean, mm. I if I mean, I, I send out my invoices on the first of every month. I don't do contracts because I don't believe in contracts. I give them 14 working days to, their, to pay. If they don't pay within that 14 business days, they don't get any work done. I don't let them go into arrears. And if they don't pay within a set time, I'll just call them up and say, I'm sorry, I'm not working on your website anymore. Oh, yeah. I think there's two, bad, you're two types of bad clients, isn't it? You've got the bad players and the one that are just going to be like time drainers. And, you know, they might be paying you for a service, but they suddenly feel that, you know, you're the agony aunt, business coach, um, you know, partner in crime. Lee, I've I've had a few like that, and suddenly you get to the point of going, "Hang on, you're paying me for this service, or you're bombarding me with like questions about your business startup, your business finance, your business whatever." Like, that's not what you pay me for. <laughs> yeah, we get that a lot too because we offer a wide wide range of services, and we're a, a small business. Um, started ten years ago, so when we work with other businesses like that, they see that and. Like you say, they come in asking for one service and suddenly they want, you know, subtly over coffee, they're trying to get you to do their entire marketing strategy or something. It can be difficult to put down those lines sometimes. But yeah. it comes back to that whole, there's only so much time, you've got to get paid for your work, otherwise you end up unviable. There's, um, there's an interesting um, the concept. Um, when you're growing a business, you so heavily need certain tools to help you get off the ground. A website being one, for example. And often we try and keep our costs low as much as possible, and that's great. You know, again, I go back to the one that I'm a big advocate of, of bootstrapping. And one downside of bootstrapping is um, you then call on some friends to help you do stuff instead. Uh, prime example of someone I know who's got a friend of theirs to do the website. The website, which is very simple, it's a one-page website, it should take no more. Realistically, if you were only dedicated on it a day or two to put together. Um, but this has been going on since August, because they're paying mates rates. Um, so therefore, the person who's doing it has no inclination to do it because they're not getting paid for it, and they're trying to kickstart their business. The other person desperately needs it, but is too polite to kind of go down there, right, give me the website today, or I've got to go somewhere else and pay for it. There is a massive false economy around mates rates and all our price says i have a mates rate discount it's zero and i totally agree with that so do i as well because ultimately i'm not i i, I need to 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 my time is worth money um and whoever pays it I, you know that that's money i lose if i if i give a discount for it arrogant as that may sound that you know ultimately is, a, is a, my most valuable resource it's not at all arrogant i mean if you if you're billing your time at conservatively fifty pounds an hour to a normal client, and then mates, mates, um, friends, they have to understand that they are taking money out of your pocket. And like you say, it's it's never a ben almost almost never a beneficial relationship. That's why we don't have, ever have mates rates, but we have businesses we work with preferentially. You know, the kind where we can help each other by sending each other business that sort of thing. But it always has to stay within that kind of, with the business hat on well, you know you don't take the business hat off when you're dealing with your business you, know, you can go to the pub with a client afterwards if you want to talk about the rugby maybe not talk about the rugby right now but when it comes to business i 
completely agree. It has to stay that way. And again, it's another difficult lesson to learn for people starting up. But it's when you have to learn, otherwise you just hurt it, hurt yourself. Anyway, um, I've got to jump off now. It's been a pleasure speaking to you guys. Ah, oh, likewise. Um, well, um, we'll stay in touch, I'm sure. Now we know you're not <laughs> I'm not. I unfortunately I've associated that Twitter handle with all my work stuff, and it's too late to change. But uh, at least you'll remember it. Don't need to change it. I think it's a, a, a conversational piece in itself. That's yeah. it. Okay. Okay. Makes you memorable. Thank you. Oh, we got somebody else trying to come in that we don't hear the. We got an egg. I'm sorry, egg. You're not coming in. <laughs> an egg, not an Ed. That was bad. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, Sam, uh, we. Are we over time? Well, actually, no, you've been here an hour because you was late. <laughs> I have. Um, but I know Saul was curious as to whether he was going to jump in um, as jump well in. because. Jump in. We've still got a few minutes. Go on, you're all right. <sighs> Hi. Yeah. Have to keep it quick. So. Yeah, this is the thing. It's, you know, I find there's actually attitudes that are uh, radically different in different countries. And like I put in the chat, this is why we recruit in the United States, unfortunately, because I say unfortunately, because having people come in with like totally different upbringings, different outlooks on like life. Sure, we'd love that, but we can't have that. No, we can't because people don't learn like to expect to have to pay their dues in other countries. We do in like U.S., Canada. But as so one I point made to you, it does sound like a generalization, though. Right, it's, it's, and it's one that applies to me. So I did two unpaid internships my, myself, the second one starting from when I was 43. Right. Right. And that's why I can do what I, because of that internship, I can do what I do now. So it paid off. And for the people that we employ as unpaid interns, like there's a lot of pressure for us to show them results, right? Yeah, and to support their careers. Right. And so we do that. Yeah, see, so unpaid internships now aren't considered a good thing in the UK. Um, you've got to pay your interns. Um, so, again, you know, you've got different, well, it's different laws even um, dealing with between the two different countries. And in this, I know, like, within the UK, if I said someone come and do unpaid work for me, they'd be like, no. Um, mm. But, again, so that's... We find, we find yeah. the same thing. So we look elsewhere. I guess, as you say, it's a cultural thing. I mean, um, Steve Dietti made a, a comment, which, um, uh, which, from his perspective, that if you bring value in, you should compensate them for that. And um, I completely agree that interns, you learn so much more about your topic when you're actually diving into the deep end and, and putting it into practice. But equally as well, the company benefits too. It should compensate for that fact. Mm, yeah, but we launch careers. So, I mean, many a time, this is why we like we have uh, the stories of 10 of our past interns, how like they'll go on an on site interview, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and the guy's just done a four year degree in electrical engineering and then a two year degree in computer engineering, and they're asking nothing about his coursework or his projects. They're asking nothing about that. They're asking about how many people did you manage at right tag? Right, okay, no right tag, but what elements of it did you build yourself? Mm. That's what they're asking them. So in other words, we're like a career launcher. Yeah, so it's, there's it's compensation. Enabling. It's enabling people to have practical experience, um, which actually brings me to Damien's question there, which is that some people do free talks through to build up charging down the line. So this works for some in the UK. I think like the speaking, like certainly yes, and, you know, and this is almost like people coming to blabs like this and they gain information. It's exactly, you know, we don't get paid for sitting here talking, um, but people may learn from it. People may get value from it. People may take that information and use it. Does it propel me as a business person? It might do. It might not do. Um, 
you know, but I'm I'm quite happy to give my value. But it, but I I can do that because I have a successful business that's paying my bills. Um, so I couldn't say right, I'm not going to earn any money this month and totally like do stuff for free because I want the experience because you know I have a family to provide for. So it's different people in different circumstances can do different things. Some people can point blank say absolutely yes, I can do stuff for free because I'm financially comfortable enough to do that. Other people are saying, no, I can't because I have to work because that's what's going to pay my bills. Um, so I don't think it's particularly right to generalize between countries because it's down to each individual. Service. No, you can. You actually can. It can be, you can actually, I, I wish it wasn't so. And I continue to test the envelope, especially since we continue to recruit for people with certain skill sets, right? certain specific skills, actually not skill sets, skills, right? So, so we're not looking at where they're from, but w what they've done and mm. what they can do, right? On the other hand, they're paying for their university degree, right? And this is a degree that no one's asking them about when Nobody they're you know, in an interview. To be honest, right? asking me about mine. <laughs> right, but you're an entrepreneur. And they're trying to get into Google. They're, they're engine. I'm talking about engineers. Yeah. They're trying to get yeah. into Google, right? And no one's asking them about what they went through all this schooling for. What they're asking them about is what they did in an actual internet startup. Mm. So actually what we're providing is something that gets them in the door at where they want to be. So uh, that's not nothing. That's not, that's not worthless actually, you know, and this is where I'd sort of like to, you know, I love the chance to meet minds with, with UK, Scotland, Ireland, and it's the same in Australia and, and New Zealand as well. It's the exact same attitude and, but it's going to come around. It's going to come around. Um, um. I, um, I, I, I think there is, there is some aspects of the cultural uh, element, but I think that internships are, as I said uh, before, are, are incredibly valuable because it gives that real life experience to anyone who's taken up that internship. And it may be that they're taking up, they're going through a door to Google that their university degree may not mm. have given them. However, the company, whichever company it is, benefits from internships as well. They benefit from that raw talent, that blank canvas, that um, hunger and desire to work for you. Both sides benefit. The benefit of the company is they get that company, they get that individual to, to come and bring that raw talent to them and give them a new way of thinking, a new direction. The benefit to that company is is, is huge. The benefit to the uh, intern is possibly a door in. But because I would say the benefit is so, the benefit that would then for make it an equal playing field is paying for them. I'm not saying you have to pay them, a, a sea level wage, of course not, but um, a, a level that helps to even further increase that loyalty and, and reputation between the individual and the company. So I think there's a cultural element here, but I'm um, from the school of thought is I, uh, an internship needs to be paid for at some aspect. I'm just going to actually make a point um, because you keep mentioning the big search engine that begins with a G and I used to work for them and um, they didn't ask me about my degree. Um, I got a ton of experience from working there, which is probably why I know so much about social media and online stuff in the first place. They also make you sign an NDA so you can't reveal stuff. Um, and what I would say is I didn't have to do any free work. Get that job there. Right. And some of the most rich by them, some right? the most successful graduate programs from some of the leading them. companies, some of the most successful graduate programs from some of the leading companies in this country pay for their internship mm. as well as giving them a fast track to a high level that maybe without that internship they wouldn't get. But at the same time, they still get mm. Oh, it's going well the sound, Ed. I'm losing you, Ed. Are you back? Have we got you? Oh no, you're echoey Ed, come back. Yeah, I'm sure he'll come back, but in the meantime, we're self funded, right? And so, and we're not in the Bay Area or London or Dublin 
right? Or like one of the startup Mecca cities. So the red carpet doesn't roll out for us. You know, um, we're self-funded. And if we began with the assumption, we can do nothing until we have tons of money and are the darlings of Silicon Valley, then we would have gone nowhere. You know, we, we work with very little. So do we, you even, know, I mean, even in the internship, the most recent internship I took on was for a videographer, but that internship was met by payments from both myself and the university that supplied that internship as well. Um, which admittedly they took from being able to charge higher uh, university fees, which is a different debate in itself. But ultimately that person still got the education, but they still gave us the commitment to us and our commitment to them is they got paid for it. Um, so it's a, it's a commitment that, that needs to be met both ways. And I think it's a beautiful thing to wrap up on, don't you Sam? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I need Thanks to for go having me. I need, I need to go and do some work, Thank you know, that's what paid for. <laughs> it's, um, I, I, would, I would suspect from many of the comments that are being left um, uh, in that uh, the, um, the winner between free internships and pay for internships is the latter. Yeah. Um, but uh, we can let people read those comments in their own time. Sam, it's been emotional. My apologies once again for stepping in too late. Uh, and but thank you for, uh, for Lee and for Saul and, and, and for Steve Yeti for joining in too, and for Robert for his witty comments and insight always. And, and of course, I, you know, I can't forget that, you know, beautifully stepping into the shoes before I took over was Leanne, so thank you. Yes, and there are some great comments actually there um, and some really good points that were raised. And and I think regardless of the whole, um, re in, you know, th there's great value to using cheap or free services when you are a startup. But inevitably, if you want experience and you want skill and you want talent, you're going to have to pay for it. And rightly so, and rightly so. This is a fair yeah. economy, and it's not fair if you're getting all the work and not paying any money back. And I would, and I also think I want that person to have to leave that internship with as much positivity about the company they work for, because again, you don't know where you're going to connect to them again further down the line. That connection yeah. is helped by you paying for them, paying for that skill that they've learned. So that's that's why. Right, right. We're going to wrap it up. My stomach's rumbling. It needs food. It's not on its 11s as yet. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. I will put the replay up on my YouTube channel for anyone that wants to go and see it. Please join us again next week. Um, it might not all be about Ed. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Maybe on him this week. I was like, your subjects, go with it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear actually from other people what they think is... Um, uh, what uh, what people think the topic should be for our next show. Yeah, and if anybody likes to make any suggestions, um, that saves me having to scratch my head on a shoe tonight and go, bloody hell, like, what we're talking about tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> rather, than, rather than a chat at half ten at night going, this is what we're going to talk about, um, maybe we can get some insight from others. We should have a hashtag for this so that we can follow it, but let's not worry about that for now. Let's, I need um, coffee. Yeah. Right. Thank you, everybody. Do tweet us um, your suggestions or even go to the group we have. And we will see you all next week. Goodbye.